is that academic journals have an ethical responsibility to reject the submissions that defend colonialism. You're welcome. The first speaker from the executive team. My grandparents, who were basically colonized by the British and both the Japanese, do not deserve to have some privileged academician have their um, have their submission of to defend colonialism be uh, accepted. We think that it's just basically a disrespect and just an, a rejection of the human dignity. We think that we should definitely uphold those things, especially when you're an academician and you have the power to do. So. Going on to my clarifications, I would just like to tell you my two arguments, which are firstly, why the why we should reject, why is there an ethical responsibility, and secondly, what harms will materialize if they accept the submission itself. Before I go on to my arguments, I have a few clarifications. First thing, on submissions on colonialism, we are okay with factual studies such as you uh, like studying who like who partook in those uh, colonialism itself and what effects colonialism had on like let's say Malaysia and Indonesia. But what we're not okay is is with that obviously like uh, the submissions that obviously defend colonialism and that try to justify it as a normal practice or even a practice that should still withstand today. We think, secondly, that academic journals are normally academic institutions and organizations such as Harvard University or any other journal uh, organizations who accept uh, submissions for them to post. They, we think that they have an ethical responsibility to reject since they have the power to do so. So we think that, thirdly, what does these um, submissions usually look like? We think that it's actually very hard for you to defend colonial itself without having certain sentiments or certain statements which are derogatory or racist or you know bigotry in nature. We think that four, we should just reject it. Uh, immediately because it's very hard for you to say like you know there was a necessity for it uh, that you know these nations had to be colonized it will always have to be paired with certain statements which are derogatory in nature we think that's why it should be banned straight away so then going on to my first argument why is there an ethical responsibility we think that there is an ethical responsibility because the academicians they are the ones who have the platforms to, uh, they are the ones who uh, platforms where the journals are submitted. They are the medium to spread ideologies itself, right? Not usually for an ideology, especially to legitimize it and actually give it credibility. People send it to these journals because the moment you see an academic journal, you normally think that it's correct, it's based on facts and data, and that it's really hard for you to actually go argue against it. So that's the credibility and legitimacy that you connect it with, right? We think that having the power to give this legitimacy means that um, these academicians actually have a really high moral responsibility and they should definitely uh, think about it first. This means that, secondly, this is their community itself, right? Academicians, we think, have a moral responsibility onto others. So just because, like, you're an academician, you know, as an individual, you also have to take into account of what your community or another academician actually, like, submits or what ideologies he also propagates. We think that we can see this with doctors. We have the Hippocratic Oath where we uh, try to mitigate the harms of, like, another person who's also within our practice. Even with debating, we actually have an equity team to try to ensure that people respect preferred pronouns. That means that they have to consider that you cannot just like stand as individuals and allow these uh, ideologies to be propagated within your community. I think that that uh, develops like why is an ethical um, responsibility. Secondly, so why is it this ideology itself should be re uh, rejected? We think that when is it that we reject certain ideo ideologies? We think that as long as there is an existing harm in the present, then especially in the state of school, then we can uh, we, we basically don't allow it to be propagated. That it means like even in studies when you have research itself, you say you cannot use children. Even now, like people are really going against animal testing itself. That means that there are definitely more 
moral standards when it comes to academics and when they conduct research itself that should be taken into account because it goes against their um, ethical responsibility. We even see that there are a lot of uh, times when academicians refuse to actually um, actually post out um, studies that contain racism or that just basically propagate, propagate any negative ideologies which they know have an existing harm and will propagate those uh, harms itself. So then going on to my second argument, what harms would materialize if they accept the submission, right? We think that there are two ways, like why is colonial, colonialism included, right? We think that there are two ways that colonialism or the ideology of defending colonialism would actually uh, materialize. Firstly, if it defends uh, the colonialism done in the past. Secondly, the ones that are currently happening or like as a way of life itself or allowing it to happen, justifying it itself, right? We think that firstly, in terms of the present, we think that the harm itself from this is legitimizing uh, derogatory or racist statements. Because when you legitimize or when you allow for or when you defend colonialism in the present, like for it to be a justified means of, you know, def defending your country or even trying to get what you need, what you need, like going to Iran or going to Iraq or going to Afghanistan to get petrol whatsoever because you need it and it's part of your country or just using it as a defense um, defense um, tool. We think that what happens is you you legitimize derogatory and racist statements because you have to see the power of academics in the community itself. People look up to them. People see that whatever they say is something which is, like I said, again, credible. So they see them as very educated and the leaders of the community. So whatever is propagated by these academicians, they usually like are able to be spread down or trickled down towards the people on the ground itself. When the people on the ground actually follow these kinds of ideologies as well, what happens is you get all those harms. Like I said, like what happens is like you get the far right in EU being actually legitimized because a lot of the times we can tell the far right in EU that what you're doing is racist, what you're doing is derogatory, or it's just like taking stripping away from people's human dignity. But like it's harder for you to do that when there are actually credible or legitimate journals who are also reporting on this and saying that it's actually Actually, it's like it's, it's plausible that it could be a legitimate ideology. We think that means it's harder for us to reject these statements. We think that that's bad. Secondly, so like, what are the harms of defending the colonialism that happened in the past? We think that, like I told you about my ancestors, right? There's like there's just no way to defend colonialism in the past that that, that included like basically. Uh, dehumanizing people to become slaves and like taking away everything from them. What you do is you strip away, the biggest harm we think is that it strips away human dignity of people in the colonial co colonialized nations. Because what you're inherently telling them is that it was justified to make your ancestors slaves. Or it was justified that those people went into your country and killed your grandparents or like basically raped your grandparents because it was a justified thing to do. It was a necessity. Therefore, you're stripping away the, the like dignity of the ancestors who you might say, oh, they're dead. Who cares? But it's also taking, stripping away your dignity as well because you do obviously connect to the reputation of your ancestors. We think that what happens, uh, how it is portrayed now is that two things will happen. Firstly, we think in the current setting, firstly, we think that that means that people are able to justify to not give reparations, right? Because when you are able to defend colonialism, there's no point, like you saying it's a good thing. When you say it's a good thing, there's no point of giving you reparations, right? Because reparations is obviously to fix a mistake. When you say it's not a mistake, they, they have like obviously ammunition to have like, let's just say McCain and Ted Cruz saying like slavery was a good thing. So why should we fix the problem? Why should we give reparations? There's just no point. We think that that's very harmful, especially considering that a lot of these communities who actually face the brunt of like the harms of colonialism are still in a vulnerable position where they are disadvantaged, let's just say in the academics or in work life where they need those reparations to help them. Secondly, we think that it also justifies the invasions of other countries right now, such as Iraq and Afghanistan, we don't think that that's at all good. We think that right now we are on the side of protecting human dignity and we think it's just an ethical responsibility of these academicians. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you.
Are you good? As a team coming from the Philippines that has also been colonized by Spain for 300 years, it is very understandable that it may become uncomfortable to talk about colonialism and in some instances how the benefits that accrued from colonialism. But we have to be reasonable in this debate. We have to ask what the likely form in which this research will take. We don't think the most common forms are going to be things that justify its intent in its entirety, right? They're likely often to be qualified given they're the, in the academe. So what is this likely to look like? These are statements that try to prove, for example, that the public education system was benefited through the settlement of the Spanish in the Philippine colonies. These are things like trade was more engaged with these, uh, with, with the, like, like the younger civilizations once they started to be colonized. They're often not going to be sweeping generalizations about like, like essentialist racist statements. The reason why that's not likely to be the case is because these are statements that just are harder to prove on an empirical level, which is why the most reasonable ones are likely to be more qualified and more nuanced research. Our class is simple. One, we support status quo in the form of empirical evidence-based research. They have to go through levels of peer review, for example. The standards will still exist to determine its ethical acceptability. We disagree with any a priori standard to reject articles on the basis of its conclusion. We think we can reject articles on the basis of unethical production or gathering of the data. Also, we think these articles don't exist in a vacuum. We think the articles are often engaged with and responded to, and it's more likely to happen in the academe than outside of it. I'm gonna run one level of response before I run two arguments. My first argument is about why there are actually legitimate academic discussions to be had with regards to colonialism, the harms of completely rejecting colonialism, and second, why the academe is the best avenue to discuss this, like to have this discussion rather. Firstly, what we were given from the previous speaker was a checklist of harms of colonialism, such as things like racism, offense, lack of dignity. While we agree that a lot of these harms existed, one, these harms did not happen in a vacuum. There are a lot of benefits that have to be weighed against them. Two, they, they also, like the, the level of harm, will still exist to a large degree on their side of the house. We will argue later that when you push these discussions outside of the academe, the medium of discourse is much, much worse. But the last thing I want to suggest is it's not as if these research, uh, these forms of research exist in a vacuum, right? They're actually, in fact, more likely to be responded to, peer-reviewed in the academe or in a formal institution where exchanges are valued just as much as the initial journal, right? So this is why a lot of the harms they had are likely, one, to be able to be mitigated in our side of the house, and two, we would suggest become worse when you remove these researches from the academe. So, firstly, why are there like legitimate academic discussions to be had? We believe that there are actually large or some strings of benefits that actually accrue from certain countries. So for example, one, like we would suggest there are a lot of benefits, for example, like the education systems, language, engagement of trade, things like migration. These are all things that are activated by these colonial, uh, by like activated through colonial, like colonialization, right? So even if there are harms, we would suggest that those harms should be recognized and ought to be weighed out versus the benefits that people receive as well, right? So we are also going to agree that the harms exist or the research also agrees that the harm exists. The reason why this is likely to be the case is because they can't deny facts that have been proven already mm. empirically, right? Which is why they're likely to weigh this. For example, a good example would be the Dominican Republic, right? It like the settlement or colon colonization of the B Dominican Republic introduced order there, education, the economy. It lead to them being one of the most wealthy um, like colonial like col colonies in the ancient society, right? Which is why we think these questions are legitimate questions to ask. In the same way, we interrogate the validity of the form of government that China operates. While they are not fully democratic, they have some trade-offs such as economic benefits that are weighed like uh, uh, as such. And the second thing I want to talk about is often these are very qualified statements, not likely to be sweeping generalizations that they said will happen. The implication is this, colonialization should not be an inherent a priori evil and shouldn't be washed out and must be discussed in the marketplace of ideas because the obligation or the ethical ob obligation of the academe is first and foremost to the truth. But secondly, we would suggest under this argument that in a world where we completely place a taboo on the uh, on colon colonization, this leads to incredibly harmful outcomes. Why is this the case? 
the narrative that all consequences of colonialism are bad is incredibly dangerous because this justifies a lot of current abuses that have happened. For example, post like post apartheid South Africa, for example, was rife with corruption, but used like anti colon like anti Western sentiment as a smoke screen to remove all of the like like remove all of the accusations on them for being corrupt. Or for example, a more modern example, perhaps Duterte uh, uses anti colonial rhetoric to justify the fact that human rights are a colonial instrument and something we should reject on mass. Right? We would suggest this happens in status quo. Yes, we agree. But compared to this, much worse when the academe validifies this rhetoric that we have to reject any like consequences that came out of col co like col colonization. The second thing I wanna look at is why the academe is the best avenue for this discussion. The first thing we have to recognize is this. When we remove them from the academe, the rhetoric of individuals does not disappear. The discussion does not disappear, right? Individuals will still feel as though, or like the individuals now who think colonization has had benefits will still feel as those benefits exist. But what is likely to happen is that these discussions will be pus pushed out of the academe into things like public discourse, into things like social media, right? So there are several reasons why we think the academe is a better place to have this course for four reasons. One, it is evidence-based, right? So they have to prove it empirically. Second, it is peer-reviewed and responded to by other equally intelligent or equally like uh, people who have the expertise in these fields as well. Third, the, it requires the use of formal language, which is why it's not likely to be inflammatory. It's not likely to use sweeping generalizations because sweeping racist generalizations are poor, like it's, it's poor academic writing. They're likely to jeopardize their careers if they do this. But fourth, the length of the journal means that the discussions are likely to be more nuanced than quick exchanges in social media or public discourse. This allows us to be discoursed and responded to in a structural way versus social media and the public sphere. When a lot of argumentation can be misrepresented, when a lot of rhetoric can be inflammatory, when they are short, when they are misrepresented, unnuanced, we would suggest you have worse discourse on co co like colon colonialism and the impacts of colonialism on their side of the house. So given that we proved in the first argument that discourse is necessary and uh, we think that therefore, this is the best best avenue to have this discourse, right? Therefore, we believe that the, that the academe has the moral obligation to accept or accept these forms of academic research. So what did we prove to you in this speech? One, we dispel the notion that in actual factuality, that colonialism, colonialism was purely a checklist of harms. There were actually a lot good trade-offs to be had there, and that not that these trade-offs are always a good thing, but the, these need to be weighed and discussed in the academe. And two, we believe that the radical backswing of rejecting any narrative of colonialism makes politics, makes discourse worse off. And three, you make the discussions on colonialism themselves worse off when you push them off of the academe. Thank you. side negative has been going on a soft case. Not at one point did side affirmative say that we reject all forms of discussions on the benefits of colonialism. We think, for example, the abolishment of slavery in Southeast Asia was an effect of colonialism, but that doesn't mean that the actions of colonists of actually, number one, taking away the uh, taking away the governments that exist in the past is a justified action. Number two, there are methods of weighing war upon those people during that time, even if you want to say it's to abolish slavery, it's not something that is defendable because it abolishes the institutions that exist in the past. Therefore, right, the discussions based on fact, such as uh, whether or not slavery was abolished because colonialism came, can still happen under our side, but we do not want and we reject the conclusions that oftentimes these accreditations can make based on the 
based on the letter that it collected that they want to defend colonialism. And the fact that the first speaker of negative side also say that they also want to reject conclusion based uh, conclusion based conclusion based academic uh, journals to being good or bad means that to some extent site negative does recognize that the conclusions made by these academicians are influential enough to the layman. <laughs> Moving on to the issues that I have directly engaging the materials coming from first speaker of a uh, negative. Number one, do you really? Uh, number one, do you really? Uh, do you really need? Uh, I could, do you really need uh, defending colonialism in order for people to actually discuss the topic? Note that while the platform of def uh, of discussion might be better if you have it on an academic platform. Note that number one, not all academicians are equal. This means oftentimes academicians are also going to be biased with the research that they have. For example, right, the Google employee who collected data based on the based based on the, the amount of workers that uh, female workers in Google or based on what his opinion and collected data that female workers shouldn't be, are not as tech savvy as the uh, as not as tech savvy means that number one any kind of data collected are oftentimes biased this means if that person supports colonialism they're going to ignore data that are actually in uh, they're actually in offense of colonialism Therefore, it, it's not to say that these academicians are the best people. In fact, if anything, if they have, for example, if you're from a if you're from a conservative ultra uh, ultra uh, ultra a ultra conservative community inside of the states in which you want to support for white supremacy, it means that you're going to collect data that only benefit white supremacy and defending white colonialism that happens in the past. Therefore, we reject that academicians are the best. But on a comparative, like secondly, is it then better for these people to have the discussion? Uh, is it then better for them compared to the layman on the ground? We think when you talk about the layman, it means that the recept when you talk about academics uh, engaged with the layman, it means that you want this discussion to happen on people on the average reasonable person, and therefore you need to that be and before that happens, you need to ensure that there is a reception of the idea in the first place. We think that on a balance, right? What happens when you actually have colonialism being defended based on the topics that you want to talk about? It means that number one, sentiments are oftentimes going to affect the average reasonable person. When, for example, if you're an African American and you make journals defending colonialism, this means that oftentimes these people who are already disinterested in the concept of colonialism are not going to like the journals that you made. This means that number one, discussions for the average reasonable person are going to be worse under their side because the, because the topic that you associate the colonialism with, uh, by defending colonialism and associating with the topics that you want to discuss makes them become disinterested with the topic that you want. But number two, right, even worse, within that when you talk about people on the ground, because you want to discuss the topic, it needs to be very careful. Therefore, when you have governments in those in those society already already going Going on with the rhetoric that uh, colonialism is bad, the moment you have academicians becoming a platform or becoming the people who defend colonialism, that is where number one, governments themselves will take away the funding of the of, of the, for all in blanket towards colonialism it, for the topic of colonialism itself. What does that this mean? This means that any counter journals that more likely that you want to talk about are more likely number one, unlikely to happen because institutions such as academic institutions will not want their academic institutions to be unpopular because they want they want to appeal to the government that is the government and the people who are, ex are already not liking the concept of defending colonialism number two we also think even if you want to assume private institutions will fund these journals we think it's unlikely to happen because if anything private institutions are more profit oriented this means right if you already have a paper defending colonialism and that paper becomes popular and people have a a huge uproar on it, and this is best case scenario that the paper does become a success. That is when private institutions will more likely not pull away their fundings and run away from those topics because they do not want to be associated with things that the society does not want. Therefore, right, best case scenario under their side. Even if you want to have some discussions on an academic base, you will not have that discussion because under their side, the governments and the private institutions pulls away the funding. And this is crucial because note that their argument of discussion can only happen 
if there are counter narratives towards defending colonialism in absence of this counter narrative number one you have this right you have these papers exist in status quo and they're the only papers that exist and because they are the only data that exists that is when that data becomes popular and becomes accepted by the society to be fact we think that is why it's a worse comparative under their side moving on right we think that when you talk moving on right uh moving on we think that when you talk about uh we, we think when you talk about defending colonialism and you need to ensure that there are if, and you need to ensure that there are no harms towards the party this is also principle and also practical outcomes of the principle of why you do not want colonialism because not that they did not try to engage on the principle when we talk about defending are we when number one we think that when you want to talk about uh defending colonialism you need to we, we, academic journals should always be risk averse because you do not want that academic your academic papers to be Become the source of suffering for other people. No, that is status quo. Conservatism and populism and white racism is a rise in the United States and a lot of states in the European uh, European area. This means, right? Number one, when you more, the more you have, where the more you have topics of defending colonialism, that is when you have more people on the ground justify the actions of their government to actually only want the race-based uh, supremacy. Do you think this is harmful? Because a lot of the times, people like Ted Cruz, people like Donald Trump would want to co opt the idea of academicians to be on their side and will, will, will selectively pick data that benefits them. This is harmful because under their side, and because they already disempower government because they already disempower the academic institutions to make counter papers that is when you have these governments that these politicians that exist that are in support of colonialism being able to justify that idea number two we think that politicians now will have an incentive to ensure that any form of claims that they made are associated with the call it defending colonialism papers we think this is most harmful because not only are your politicians becoming the image of what that country is but that politicians know that because you have fact you have more backing and more people defending the idea and especially when the academicians themselves are defending the idea to conclude right their best case scenario depends on the existing of discussion that skews to the left however given that they're going to pull away the funding given that the governments now have incentive to actually propagate colonialism ideas we think it's unreasonable at all that the average no person on the ground will discuss it against colonialism in that sense we can be done Ladies and gentlemen, what is the ethical responsibility of academic journals? Because the, the, to the extent that they discuss this in government bench was to say that the ethical responsibility stems from the, the power they have in society. But they never really told us what a moral thing necessarily is. Coming from negative, we said that the ethical responsibility of academic journals is the truth, to be able to produce knowledge to the best of your ability. And we suggested that if your ethical pursuit is to know the truth, we cannot have preconceived biases or preconceived conclusions unless we are 100% sure that there is an a priori wrong or right in society. And the reason for that is just because we think that colonialism has been bad for the vast majority of the world doesn't mean that colonialism is always bad for the vast majority of the world. And that is the burden that affirmative bench in this debate has to prove because they are effectively excluding any form of discussion that like the tries to defend colonialism in any extent possible. We suggested that if there, if it is really blatantly bad, then any form of discussion that tries to defend colonialism will be taken out. But there are legitimate questions that are asked by people who defend colonialism. One, they ask about the data that is provided. A lot of times, these Western institutions, or these institution, academic institutions, are so anti-colonialism, it's very unlikely that they gather the data that they necessarily have. But two, even if the facts are the same, 
the question is always, are these values justified? So for instance, they pointed out that a lot of decolonialism abolished slavery in Southeast Asia. For some people, the benefit of abolishing slavery, which is removing the subjugation of entire class of individuals, is more important than the harms they possibly created in massacres. In the same way that a lot of morally atrocious things are debatable. For instance, whether a war is justified because killing some lives might be justified in improving the lives of everyone else. We would suggest just because some people suffer in society and you think it's regrettable, doesn't mean it's an a priori evil that exists in society and ought to be negotiated. What was their response? They said, you can still have nuanced discussions without the conclusion that colonialism is justified. Why do we think that these nuanced discussions of facts are unlikely to happen without papers that explicitly defend colonialism? First, if indiv the individual hypothesis is not to defend colonialism, but to go against colonialism, then we don't think there is any incentive for academic editions to look for other possible counter arguments to show the harms, the benefits of colonialism, because it harms the ability for them to make a strong paper. That is why the hypothesis is important. But secondly, even if we assume that they will talk about the same amount of facts under their side of the house, we think that there are subjective ethical questions that need to be asked and need to be debated upon. For instance, is the, does the end justify the means? Or is these human rights violations okay for the structural benefits we get in the long run? These things are not matters of fact, but are matters of opinion that are discussed only when the conclusion of your paper is hinged on the trying to defend like, colonialism. So we would suggest that there is no a priori benefit to immediately assume that a colonialism is a bad thing and therefore by the or moral obligation of these academic institutions is to continue allowing the discourse to take place. But the next thing they said was, outcomes is a harmful thing. First, you would suggest that you have to prove why the outcomes justifies ethical responsibility. There might be potential outcomes of discussing the differences of race, for instance, or studying the differences of gender, or studying even mental health practices, but that's not an argument to not study these things, but an argument to study it in a more sensitive manner. We would suggest that if that's the case, then they have no way to produce knowledge, because other people might be offended in any form of study they necessarily have. My question is, where do they draw the line on the affirmative bench when they would decide something is unethical because it creates harmful outcomes versus something that is ethical to begin with? But my question is, will there be harmful outcomes? Because we responded to this under two levels. First, we said that the problems of colonialism being solely propagated and the terrible effects of colonialism being repeated again are contingent on this narrative being the dominant narrative that exists. The argument coming from the depth, like the second they accept some journal articles that defend colonialism. I just want to note that our burden is not defend only accept only the articles that defend colonialism. They can also accept counter articles that exist like the defend colonialism. But this analysis was safe. People are angry at this, the academic journals because they pro promote unpopular opinions like colonialism is being good and the state will defund them and private institutions won't fund these in individuals as well. We think this is blatantly untrue. If people are angry at a certain academic journal because they believe it is biased, it is bigoted, it is promoting or defending colonialism, then they have every incentive to fund other academic journals or other papers to go against this in, like, information because obviously they don't want to have this unchecked, right? So they're likely to fund other outlets or other researchers to disprove all the claims made by this paper because leaving it unchecked will allow the like, academia or like this proliferation to exist. So we don't think that the, the reduction of the checks and balances will happen on our side. If anything, it will increase because now we have a trigger for them to respond to these points. But secondly, we suggest that if your argument is we should never put on popular opinions because it'll reduce funding, this is an argument for anything that goes against the status quo. So for instance, at a time when gay marriage was condemned, it's an argument about researching why gay marriage is possibly ethical because you pull against like, the funding you necessarily have. Or when slavery was okay, it's an argument for abolitionists to be studying about slavery. We have such as that's not a justification for us not to study. In fact, it's a justification for us to continue studying and pushing this course forward. But what I would suggest now in extension is that the worst parts of colonialism, and if you assume it's an inherent evil altogether, are worsened by their side of the house when the academia rejects them to begin with. And we'll analyze this on two levels. We suggest that their solution makes the problem worse. The first reason is it creates a distrust in the academia as a whole. They assume that the normative power of the academia will remain stagnant on both sides. And if the academia only professes anti-colonial narratives, that it will still be as trusted as if it promotes both. 
we would suggest this not. And the reason for this is, the point at which academics are rejecting these journals, they reduce the credibility altogether. Because they're not able to be perceived as objective, they're not able to be perceived as fair, because they already have an initial bias of liberalism that goes against any form of colonialism. Why is this pro problematic? Because now any journal produced by the academe would be perceived as liberal propaganda. This is the same harm that we're happy seeing right now when a lot of new They're all portrayed to be fake media or fake news or fake information in the post-truth world that exists today. Why is that problematic? Because even if we assume that the academe under the rest of the house will only publish journals that are pro-colonialism or sorry, anti-colonialism, the belief of the people on the ground will be that they're lying, right? That they're hiding facts because they're afraid of telling the truth, right? The rhetoric of right-wing individuals or pro-colonialism individuals who will now take the discourse into the mainstream will say, look at these academicians hiding the facts. They're not supposed to be believed. They're fake. They shouldn't be trusted within society. So we would suggest the ability for you to get that credibility diminishes under their side of the house. But secondly, we would suggest that if you're not able to talk about these legitimate concerns of people who are pro-colonialism, maybe they really benefited, or the people in society are able to benefit from colonialism, then any argument that you make that doesn't look at these concerns, like look at the possible benefits you have, because your academe is heavily anti-colonial, would mean that you're unlikely to cater to them and be persuasive to them. We would suggest that the best counter model is to engage them in the academe because that's the best way we have them having structured discourse, but for the potentiality for the academe to be trusted because we look objective, because we look at both sides of the story. Just because something is uncomfortable to you doesn't mean you should take it away and shut it up. We're very proud to post. Thank you. Kyle, some things are just objectively harmful. Things like fascism, things like sexism, things like um, like racism. These are things that are objectively harmful. You might have benefited in, in, in some ways from it. For example, a lot of American families actually benefited from slavery, but we do not use that to justify the fact that slavery was who justify the very presence of slavery. Those who, the proponents of colonialism, the current proponents of colonialism would oftentimes use things like Slavery bring democracy to Africa and India. That's why we have a huge population of the world that's currently under democracy. These are the kind of things that they use to justify all the horrendous things that they actually want to talk about. So if some Philippines who actually benefited from the uh, colonization of Philippines by Spain, I do not know why that would justify the fact that like millions of people in India actually starved to death under the colonial uh, leadership of the British. I think these are the kind of things they have to defend under their own side of the house. You can't just come here and tell us like you're going to, uh, you have an obligation to the truth, but you have an obligation to the truth in the sense that you're only willing to take some parts of the truth. I think you have to take the whole truth. If it benefits the Philippines and in their public school system, then you have to talk about how it also harms the Philippines in the sense that you put a lot of people into some degree of exploitation. Secondly, this is extremely important because this is a recharacterization of what needs to happen in the debate. It's also easy. It's also the kind of things people would say, like a fascist government in Germany during the Second World War is a good government because at that time Germany experienced Germany experienced uh, some kind of economic prosperity. That's true, but that doesn't justify the horrendous thing that the yeah. Hitler government actually do. Because when you like putting people in term camp and all the kind of things that society actually likes. So when you use all this kind of benefit to actually justify the very existence of colonialism or any kind of dangerous ideology we all consider dangerous in society, that's when people are more likely going to use it as an excuse for why it actually exists to begin with. I'm going to tell you why that's 
back. Third, the effects of colonial rule on most of this country are things that, like, there are much more reason for us to actually discuss is the fact that Africa is in a, is in a despicable condition right now, or the fact that billion, millions of Indians are actually very poor as a result of the way their resources were exploited historically. I think that's enough reason and enough justification for us to have a discourse as to why colonialism exists and why it's essentially bad. I do not think academics talking about it is the best way, but people who are actually affected on the ground talking about it is the best way for us to have any kind of discussion on their side. I do not think they take that on their side. But uh, fourthly, for characterizing that clarification I want to give, understand that so far they've never really given us a single benefit as to why publication of this article would bring any kind of benefit to the society to begin with, or like not publishing it would bring any kind of harm to society. I think we're still waiting for that and it's really, really, really late on that week. Lastly, distrust, they want to talk about distrust of academics and this is where it's really become extreme. They characterize to us that look, uh, colonialism is bad, that's the popular idea. I think any kind of academic journal or academic article that produce anything that counter the popular narrative is more likely to receive backlash. That's just intuitive. Like people are more likely to distrust academic when they actually say, look, these are the benefits that we actually get from colonialism. And I think it's more likely under your side that people actually distrust academic. Then two issues I'm going to have in my speech. First, I'm going to give you, uh, first, do academic journals have ethical responsibility in principle? I'm gonna tell you why they do not engage on the other side uh, with us. But secondly, what does this course look like on both sides and why we win that clash effectively? Uh, first, let's talk about the principle here. We told, they told us that, look, the ethical obligation for an academic is to, one, produce knowledge at its best, good. Second is they have an obligation to the truth. If that's the case, let's take them at their best. If you're gonna, have, if you have obligation to your truth, it means you have to tell it in its whole, in like in in its entirety. You have to tell the whole truth. That is to say, if the Filipino education system actually benefited from the Spanish colonialism, you also have to talk about how the Philippine, the, the people of the Philippines were subjected to a lot of exploitation and harm by this by the Spanish government as well. I, I do not think that's the kind of things you get under the side because when these articles are written, it's more often than not that you have situation in which they use it as a justification for why colonialism was necessarily good under their time. But secondly, we told you, secondly, producing knowledge, let's engage with that as well. Because you produce half of the knowledge when you actually tell people that these are the benefits of colonialism. What do we tell you? We told you that there are some things that are objectively bad. Colonialism is a situation in which you suspend human rights, you subject a lot of people to inhumane treatment, you exploit them, you kill them unnecessarily, extrajudicially. These are the kind of things that happen during colonialism. It's just the same thing as fascism. In as much as academic article actually reject paper that wholly defend fascism, racism, and any kind of ideologies that would deem as dangerous in society, we think it's justified for them to do that. But secondly, they have the power to control the benefits and the harms that actually comes of the comes out of the publication of all these kind of things. That is an entire speech of my these two speakers before me who actually talk about this. I'm going to be talking about that later. But lastly, we told you that it's also a situation in which you have to defend a group, like you have to be the representative of public opinion or represent, representative of what society deemed good or bad. The fact that you, you allow your, like you have the power to allow your platform to be used to actually propagate all this kind of ideology means you have an ethical responsibility as to whether or not to publish it or not. Then ethical responsibility stems from the fact that it's is it beneficial to the society or is it harmful to society? I think we've given you sufficient analysis as to why that is essentially harmful to society. Even if you can get some benefit, I think the harms that comes from it far outweighs the benefits and they can't just go away with this principle. We win that principle on our own side. But second, let's talk about discourse. And this is really, really important, right? Because look, when you look at this discussion in this kind of issue, who are those people who are more likely going to access or even want to look at this uh, academic journal? These are people who want to use it to defend all the harms, who want to use it to defend all the harms of colonialism. That is to say, they want to justify the fact that colonialism was actually something that's necessarily good. But secondly, there are fringe individuals or fringe media group like Breitbart who also wants to use it to justify their stance on some dangerous ideology which they perpetrate in society. These are the kind of people who actually do that. But also the kind of people who write it are the kind of people who are also academic, accidentally academic or they might incidentally be academic, but they have all these kinds of dangerous ideas and they want 
to justify it in the most credible way possible. You give a lot of credibility when you actually allow that. Imagine saying, I published this in Oxford Press. These are the kind of legitimacy that actually comes with you putting it on a publication. Like, look, this was put on a publication. Even if, even if on their side, there was a public, there was a peer review that actually reviews this. Media organizations that are on the fringe, individuals that are on the fringe would not take all those peer critics. They would never use it. They would only take the ones that actually favors them, the one that actually plays into the narrative that they try to push into society. This is when it becomes extremely dangerous. On their side, the kind of people who are more likely going to use it are fringe individuals, fringe media, who are also able to put it on social media. And understand that when it becomes something that you put on Oxford Press, this is when it becomes more mainstream when other bigger media organizations are able to put it. Because Oxford Press is actually a press that's very reputable. And putting what they write is something that actually could make the news in the day. On their own side, on their own side, what we essentially do is we deny these individuals the ability to legitimize or give any kind of credibility to what they have. Even if there's going to be discussion within themselves, it's going to be discussion in an echo chamber that doesn't really go into society. It's going to be a discussion that everybody is actually comfortable with. On their own side, what essentially happens is these people are able to cherry pick on what actually benefit them and put it on social media or put it on media and say, look, we published this in Oxford Press. The trade off on our own side is maybe there's going to be an echo chamber of some random idiots, but we think it's far better when you actually protect a larger part of the population from the kind of discussion that would make them uncomfortable. We're extremely proud to propose. Yeah. Thank you. It can be very tempting to look at history and social issues as matters of black and white, but reality is rarely so clear cut. Often life is messy, um, issues are messy, and there are a lot of stakeholders you have to take into account. More often than not, people cannot always come to this conclusion completely by themselves. This is why we think actors like the academe are so important, because it is not our job to dictate to people what is right or wrong, but it is our job to provide them the facts and the capacity to make that decision on their own, to come to those conclusions with the help of evidence, with the help of data, and with the help of all of these resources, right? So we think that under this debate, I'm going to be talking about three different issues. Firstly, does this even fall under the umbrella of unethical responsibility? Secondly, is this truly objectively bad? And if it is, is it our place to pre-decide that for people? And thirdly, what actually happens when we shut this discourse out of the academe? But before that, let's go to fear battle to the previous speaker, right? He told us that, well, there's some things that are simply objectively harmful. There's some things that are unconscionable that we cannot even think about. But we think that, yes, while it is true crimes were committed through colonization, it is true people were deprived and marginalized. There was things like loss of indigenous culture, for example. We think that it's very, very hard to weigh these things against, for example, benefits you get in trade, benefits you get, for example, in culture being rejuvenated by your colonizers as well. Because we recognize not absolutely every single case of colonization was one of extreme mass atrocity. A lot of these cases, we were enriched to a certain extent by our colonizers, even though it meant in other areas we were impeded. We think that it's on their side of the world where we will categorize all of these instances as herefore a priori bad and a priori like something that is regrettable, when in reality we think we want to take a much more nuanced approach to these things. Because there is always something to learn from these kinds of issues and from the history we come from. And I'll talk about that more in the issues, right? But he told us, he was pushing us, right? To prove that colonization was good in all contexts. He said, no, you can't just pick one context or you can't just pick one strand of thought. We tell you that's simply like academically lazy, right? We can pick different strands of thought that we wish to defend and others that we might find more regrettable. In the same way, we can defend different strands of Islam or we can defend different strands of feminism. We think that it's lazy to simply force us to defend absolutely all aspects or all contexts when we explicitly told you that's not our burden in the debate. But lastly, when he told us that, well, there is backlash when you defend 
colonialism and distrust will essentially manifest on your side. We think this is unlikely because firstly, the majority of research to begin with is already anti-colonialist in nature. There is so much study and so many years and decades of research that literally tell you colonialism was the worst thing to have happened to the developing world and that it impeded its growth and all of these things, right? So we think that the counter narrative absolutely does exist and them continually claiming that it's non-existent is just simply false. But do you think that distrust manifests when, for example, you're only presenting one side of that argument, which isn't what's going to happen in our world. What happens in our world is that at the very best, you will present a balanced view of these things. At the very worst, maybe it will be like one article about pro-colonialism versus 30 anti-colonialist articles. But at the very least, you're making that discussion on a platform where that engagement can actually happen productively and it isn't shut off to a place where it will radicalize and it will become more extreme. But let's go to the first issue. Does this even fall under an ethical responsibility? Because coming from their first speaker, there really was no defense as to why this is an ethical responsibility per se, except for her to say that it's a big platform with a wide scope of influence and it lends legitimacy to ideas. This only proves that we should be discerning of what we publish, but that doesn't endorse this particular course of action. That was something that they had to do the legwork to prove, but they simply relied on this one liner of, well, it's a big platform, therefore it's your ethical responsibility. What was our response to this? We told you that an ethical responsibility of academic journals falls under things for example, like criticizing the methodology of study. For example, it is um, like to omit facts from your data, to omit facts from your study is something that is ethically abhorrent and something um, most academics frown upon, right? You're having literally fallacious claims that go completely against what your data says. That is something we do not like. Also things like plagiarism. But the point of this is that all of these fall under things like the methodology of the way that you got that data. Because the a priori or the number one standard that we want to uphold is that we want to produce this knowledge to the best of our ability. But we never, and we never pre-decide for people what that knowledge should be or what that conclusion should be. We simply provide the different, um, the different balanced views and provide the information as best we can. We think that's the role of an academic journal in this world. And if they think it is otherwise, they had to prove to us why, for example, we're going to take this much more social justice approach or this much more active approach when it comes to changing the way we talk about these issues. They didn't prove that to us or build up that point of substantive, right? But then under the second issue, is it really truly objectively bad in all instances? And is it our place as an academic journal to decide? We told you that it's a very hard metric or it's a very hard balance to make, right? Because on their side, they told us this should simply be rejected because the harm exists. And that is the main standard, that harm exists. Firstly, they didn't tell us why this harm is so overwhelming to the point it cannot be mitigated by anything else. All of those assumptions were predicated on the, uh, the idea that there is no counter narrative. There is nothing to stop this radicalism. There is nothing to stop Ted Cruz, for example, from saying that marginalized groups should continue being marginalized. We think that we told you from Nacho from the very start that we already have the counter narratives to begin with. And even as an academic journal, we will actively encourage them, right? If someone gives us like a 30 page manifesto as to why anti-colonization is bad, by all means, we will publish it alongside the 30 page manifesto about why it is good. We think that that's where we get people to trust us because we aren't endorsing one certain thing. We're telling you that you can make that decision yourself. At the best, we will give you the evidence to make that choice or to make that calculation. But this leads me to the last issue, right? About um, what actually happens when we shut out this discourse. Because coming from them, we only heard this extreme extent of harms where people, they assume that all people will automatically buy into this idea. And in fact, they only built up the analysis behind this at WIP. We told you that at least on our side, we get a more balanced view and access to both sides happens on the best possible platform. Why do we think the academia is the best possible platform for this information to come out and for this discussion to happen? We told you it's because number one, this course is simply not as holistic or productive when held elsewhere. But why it's particularly better in the academe is because formal discussions and language are things that are used. For example, you cannot simply make sweeping statements like they wanted to say, or you cannot make generalizations that are completely unfounded. So issues like racism and bigotry that have no moral basis, that have no academic basis, are simply going to be swept aside and we won't publish it anyway, because on our existing ethical responsibilities like plagiarism, fallacious claims, things that are unfounded, those don't fall under that, right? I mean, those fall under that. And that means we will discount it anyway. So we don't think the harm is necessarily that we have inherent bigotry or inherent 
racism. But he also told you that the fact that it's a longer format, the fact that you can have it in depth versus, say, for example, a Facebook post or a blog or an audio book or all of these other things, we think this is a better format to really flesh out the nuances of this argument rather than just having one-liners that might be catchy and catch like the general public's eye. We think as well, the fact that the academia is peer-reviewed, right? The fact that most of these academics, their reputation is on the line uh, given the things they will discuss. So most of them are unlikely to simply make claims that are false. And we, the only response to this was that academics can be biased. They can also ignore data that's not convenient. Yes, there may be some crooked academics, right? We think the majority still care about their reputation and credibility. And even the small percentage who choose to be crooked academics or academics who don't follow ethical standards won't be a problem in our side anyway, because they already fall under our existing ethical responsibilities. But they told you as well that the sentiments of people will be affected by those academic journals, all these things. We think all the more when that discussion happens in a world where there are less checks and balances, there is less of a capacity for us to control how that discussion comes out. And there's more chance for things like a radical backsliding and complete rejection of colonialism. For all these reasons, we're very proud to oppose. Thank you, Victoria. Negative, and we welcome back the negative for positive. I think there are three broad questions that summarize this debate. The first is, what is this discourse or these journals, what do these journals look like? Because coming from them, they characterize them as inflammatory, as racist, as bigoted, and all of these things. We suggested that the structure of an academic journal and a research article prevents these harms from existing. So it's unlikely to use inflammatory language or racist language because you have to use talking language in an academic setting. But any claim you make has to be backed by facts, has to have a footnote, and all of these things. That is why the likely scenario is this research is fair. Because if it is not fair, and if it lies about things, and it hides data or misconstrues data, then by virtue of the standards of the methodology, we cannot publish this article. right? So we would suggest that they have to be reasonable in this debate and accepting that the likely scenario is these articles are fair. And no, we don't have to defend that it defends all forms of colonialism because it can defend any form of colonialism. The motion is said to be general, so we're uncertain why we have to defend colonialism as a whole. We can say we can defend colonialism in parts. But even if it's colonialism as a whole, we suggest that we can't suggest that colonialism is an a priori bad if you have to wait to the possible benefits that exist. So the next question then becomes, should we have discourse on colonialism? Because a standard coming from government benches, we don't talk about things that are objectively bad. But if you look at it, they never proved why colonialism is an objective bad. They say it's because it exploits people. But coming from NEG, we told you that just because something exploits people doesn't mean it's an objective bad. It has to weigh between the possible benefits that you can get. We give you multiple parallelisms of morally gray areas that exist. Things like wars, where you might kill people, you might exploit the lives of soldiers, but might lead to better outcomes of fighting the war. Or think countries like China or the government of China, which might exploit individuals, but creates economic prosperity. There was no response to any of these parallelisms. And because we have shown you why there's similar instances of exploiting people, but they never showed why it's a bad thing, and we suggest that exploiting people shouldn't be a sufficient standard to claim that something is objectively harmful. But so what this means that with a pursuit of knowledge, we should be talking about these questions and still discussing these questions, especially when it comes to matters of fact. Then they said, but then we said, coming from our first opposition speaker, was that if we live in the echo chamber of affirmative, which is the verbatim words coming from the third proposition speaker, is that you will also lead to exploitation when you live in a world where you totally are against colonialism and pro-anti-colonialism. We gave you the examples of the African National Congress or the territory in the Philippines who use the narratives against colonialism because it's such a taboo in these societies to justify the atrocities that exist right now because all of these human rights things are Western impositions on you. We would suggest that the converse world, in a world where we live, where there's no defense of colonialism whatsoever, leads to terrible outcomes of exploitation as well. And that's why you have a moral obligation to make a more balanced world where we discuss this as a whole and have now more moderate views of how the things work. But the last thing we did in this debate was to assume their goal, which is to say that colonialism is an objective evil that exists in status quo. Because even if you assume that, we still win this debate. 
And the reason for that is, we said that the worst forms of colonialism, the one pro-colonialism rhetoric, like the ones forwarded by Breitbart, by other, like Ted Cruz and all these other Republican conservatives that they want to talk about under the Desert House, is far more likely to be strengthened in a world where you have a distrust of the academe. And that happens because academia is perceived to be biased, because it favors only one side, it has predisposed notions. That was the argument that came coming from my second opposition speech, which you heard barely any response from in third proposition. We said, so even if you have more articles that criticize colonialism, the fact that people don't buy any of these articles because they don't believe the academia is to be trusted. The comparative world that we provided in opposition was to say that in a world where we allow the academia to be perceived to be fair, because it engages both sides of the spectrum, that's how their people are actually able to listen and read the articles. Because that's the only time for us to believe that they can actually be heard, their voices are heard that exist in society today. That is why, even if you assume that the goal of this debate is to counter the worst forms of pro-colonialism arguments, it is better for them to be heard than for them to be silenced. We're very proud of this. Thank you. Their case and stance is inconsistent. They can't claim that there are supremely a lot of benefit for colonism, but at the same time, they want academicians that counter colonism to flourish. This is inconsistent because if from the first speaker, they claim that the only way for you to actually have counter narratives is when you actually have people defending colonialism. If the outcome that you want is still for people to deem colonialism to be bad, which it is, then why do you actually need that initial discussion in the first place? The only benefit that came from the prior speaker was that, oh, you actually have oppressive governments that are using colonialism as a rhetoric to actually subjugate their people. There was no analysis or attempt made, even from the constructive speech, to say that why is it then defending colonialism is the best method to liberate those people? If anything, right, the people who do not like colonialism would reject your method of liberating them, and this was mentioned by all speakers, and do not like it to be that way. So therefore, even if there is a benefit towards having colonialism, it certainly isn't liberating people, and it certainly will not have the outcome to do so. Two main issues in this debate. First, is it actually an ethical duty for this academicians to reject this uh, the concept of colonialism and defending them. Note that this is examples given by the third speaker, such as Islam or religion, are all concepts that are not inherently bad. It was mentioned from my first speaker that the concept of colonialism is the subjugation and exploitation of other people for your own benefit. This means in principle, you're already taking away the human dignity that a person has because you want to commit that servian to you. This means in principle, it's already a wrong idea. But number two, given, and this was not engaged, but side negative. Given that you're the one who have the ability to control the kind of journals that you have, that is when you as academicians have the duty to ensure that your platform is not used to harm other people. We agree that you do have a duty to actually allow a lot of facts in status quo. But number one, we told you those facts do not come at the expense of you needing to defend colonialism. You can still talk about slavery, but your conclusion does not need to defend colonialism. Not engaged by side negative for that to be untrue. But number two, we think that when you talk about a principle, even if you want to say a uh, the Cambridge's principle is supposed to ex you know, give a lot of uh, teachings to society, that principle does not trump the principle of risk aversion that came from my first speaker. This means that if there are risks towards people actually defending colonialism, even if you have the best intentions to educate them, it means that it will not be a principle that should be adopted by the Cambridge itself. Therefore, are there actually uh, harms in status quo. 
We think that side negative did not engage at all with my speech, and especially my third speaker's speech. When we told you, regardless if there are actually check and balances, such as empirical and other, you know, people doing those checks upon whether or not those stats are true, they give no response as to what incentive right wing nationalist media have to actually want to self regulate themselves. If anything, media is like Breitbart, who have more incentive to actually get money from giving those things and giving those journals as facts, would oftentimes reject all other forms of data. Best case scenario coming from them, even if your funding does not go away, because intuitively, if something, if intuitively, if you're defending an unpopular topic, that is where people do not want the fundings to go to. Even if best case scenario, you do have some journalists uh, and some researchers. Those kinds of discussions of, of what you want will only be colonialism is good under a world where you defend colonialism. Therefore, right, the defense of colonialism comes from their side and the subjugation of people comes from their side. To conclude, right, given the fact that there was no response as to how there would be incentives of media and also people to self-regulate, especially given that this is an extremely dangerous topic, why is it then you still want the discussion, especially when the benefit is not something you can accrue? Uh,